Ich begrüße Sie ganz herzlich heute Abend hier in der Kunsthalle zur Entschuldigung, letzten Veranstaltung, Begleit, Begleitveranstaltung im Rahmen des Projektes The Grass is Always Greener on the Other Side, Neues Windobona, ein Projekt an der Kunsthalle Wien-Karlsplatz. Wir beginnen den Abend mit Pia Bismuth, dem Künstler, der dieses Projekt gestaltet hat. Pia Bismuth kommt aus Frankreich, lebt aber schon seit einiger Zeit in Brüssel. Er verfolgt einen sehr konzeptuellen Ansatz, der sich in verschiedene Medien ausdifferenziert. Skulptur ist eines, er hat aber auch zahlreiche Filme gemacht. Er ist auch als Drehbuchautor sehr erfolgreich, hat schon für eines seiner Drehbücher sogar den Oscar gewonnen. Der zweite Sprecher des heutigen Abends ist Nicolas Firqui, ein belgischer Architekt und Stadtplaner, der gemeinsam mit Pierre Bismuth dieses Projekt entwickelt hat und verantwortlich zeichnet für die, in Anführungsstrichen, Vision, stadtplanerische Vision, die diesem Projekt zugrunde legt. Beide werden ihre sehr unterschiedlichen Ansätze jeweils erläutern, auch mit sozusagen Beispielen ähm, flankieren und danach werden wir uns noch in eine Talkrunde begeben. Der Abend ist, ich sage das jetzt einfach mal, gewidmet Hans Hollein, der letzte Woche verstorben ist und der insbesondere für Nicolas Ferqui ein großes Vorbild ist und das werden Sie im Laufe des Abends merken, auch bei diesem Projekt eine nicht ganz unerhebliche Rolle gespielt hat als ein Ideengeber. Pierre, yes. you can start. Hello? Oh yeah, hi. Thank you very much for the invitation. Thank you to all of you for coming tonight. Um, I am going to do a short introduction. Uh, I think I'm going to warm you up for the main, the core of the conversation of the, this presentation that will be given by Nicola. Uh, but I want to, I want to, um, I think what I would like to do here is to Uh, uh, talk a little bit about the origin, the genesis of this project, um, which as always, and especially for me because I have a terrible uh, memory, is always uh, complicated to actually remember exactly where and why an ID uh, appeared, but I will try to, I will try to remember as much as I can. Um, I'm also very bad with dates, so I was trying to call my wife to, for her to remind me one or two exhibitions, but she's not replying, so. Um, I think the whole thing um, started uh, about the question of public art. Um, and the whole reasoning was, uh, was about Why do I have a problem with public art, art that is placed into the, the public sphere? Um, one of the reasons I was thinking of was my interest to, for the um, avant-garde her heritage and the notion of rupture. Uh, the idea that uh, art is always trying to redefine itself and to go towards territories that are not initially considered as art. And the problem is that as soon as you deal with public art, uh, as soon as you place an art piece into a public uh, place, uh, inevitably it becomes an art piece. It is very, comp it is very difficult to actually place an audience in front of an art piece without telling them this is art. It's like if uh, as soon as you um, put an artwork into the public sphere, it becomes necessarily a monument, and if that object is not about a, an historical event or a persona, this piece becomes a symbol of itself, which means art, which I think is the way that um, public artworks have shifted uh, since some years uh, in the sense that I think um, most artworks that we see on the street today become the symbol of, let's say, uh, contemporary creativity, 
I would say. And so, uh, probably because I was invited a few times to do some, uh, some art public uh, work, and I always kind of try to find my way out. Uh, I never said no to anything, but I was, I was clearly not in a very kind of comfortable position. And so I was really thinking about how to create that feeling of rupture, in other, wo in, in, in other words, how to place the public in front of something, uh, or to place the public, or to push the public to be surprised about something they would see on the, on the, in a public space. Yeah, and of course, I mean, that also comes with my extreme curiosity to everything else than art. I think that's the, the, the reasoning I was, I was doing was like, how can you put an art piece into the public space when there is already thousands of interesting things happening on the street? Um, and anything you place uh, as an art piece becomes not as interesting as everything else. So I think that was all those questions that was a, a very interesting for me. And the f let me see if I forget something here. Yeah, no, that's, that's it. So that was basically um, this, this, this very kind of uh, this critique about, about the possibility to have an effective artworks in the sp public space uh, is, I think, the starting point of uh, the work that you have seen. Did you, did, uh, by the way, is everybody, does everybody have seen the piece? You think everybody has seen the piece? You don't, you didn't. Do we, on a des photos du, de la pièce, toi, t'as montré? Okay, ça va. So I'm going to go through a few pictures here that I gathered for the talk. And, 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 and the pieces I, I took here from internet are usually rather interesting art pieces uh, by artists I, I, I like, just to give an example of different ways to deal with public art. Uh, Sorry for the quality. Actually, I think, in a way, I was thinking that Paul McCarthy is probably the one who's dealing with public space in a very interesting way. Um, this piece is actually a famous piece in Rotterdam, where, uh, where we have done with Nicola a previous project that I'm going to show you. And uh, I was always surprised that, that an artist could actually, it's right in the center of, it's very near the train station. It's a Father Christmas with a butt plug. And um, I'm like, this, those Dutch are great because how can you actually accept that in the city? I mean, I, I, I think the reason why I think McCarthy is interesting is because he's dealing with that limit about what you can do or what you cannot do in the public sphere, and he succeeded to do it in a very interesting way. Apparently, this piece was a, was a real challenge. Uh, I understood that there was a lot of very strong reaction against it, which I understand why. And, but finally, I think everybody's terribly happy about that. The present, I think if you now take out this piece, people will be very sad. It's a meeting point, apparently. I was told that like, if, you, if you want to give to someone a, a meeting point, that's where a lot of people meet. And then I would like to also talk about um, science fiction and the notion of future. Um, as you probably know, or you probably don't know, uh, in 2000, uh, four or five, um, I won an Academy Award because I wrote the synopsis of a, of a science fiction film called Eternal Sunshine of the Spotless Mind. And um, the principal 
that was written actually maybe 10 years before that. Um, and the principle was a kind of short-term science fiction scenario that was based on the idea that what would be if it was possible to actually erase very specific segment of your memory and with the idea that you could if you have like a very bad uh, you you want to you want to uh, forget uh, about one specific event of your life that would be actually possible and so the the the, the script was the synopsis uh, was based on this idea as many dystopic uh, scenario was to show how bad things will turn in case it was possible And then again, the question of the future, which also uh, came in other works of mine, uh, as is in this uh, neon piece. And I started to be fascinated by this very commercial uh, slogan coming soon, because um, I, 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 I somehow started to uh, feel that this sentence could become a kind of perfect perfect artwork. Um, uh, uh, capitalism and, 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 uh, and consumerism and art sharing the same thing is that desire is what becomes the most important. And so what, uh, what this sentence was kind of bringing it was this eternal desire for something that will never come. It's not, uh, people think it's about not being f fulfilled. It's the opposite. It's like eternal fulfillment because th the only thing that you need is to keep the desire high. And so I thought this was like a perfect art object if I could just uh, produce object based on this sentence, it would become a kind of totally symbolic, perfect artwork. And so I've used that a few times. Uh, that's in, uh, in Switzerland, in Geneva, on the top of a building. Uh, and that, uh, there, there was other project paintings. And I tried to actually just vary the, the medium. And um, I, still, I still do like this sentence a lot. And, uh, People think it's my interest for movies, but it does, it's not exactly actually used. This sentence is used in any kind of commercial context. Um, and that led me somehow into the question of the billboard, which I started to be very interested in, partly because of their kind of ugliness, um, but also because they they were um, strangely presenting a very near future uh, and in a very economical way. I just, I don't remember, that's a part I don't really remember, but I, I somehow I started to imagine that I could use Billboard to present public art uh, project without actually doing them. Um, and, and, and very effectively without spending too much money because a billboard is actually not so expensive to produce. And so I was thinking that would be interesting to put in the public space some billboard presenting like the uh, erection of a, of a sculpture or an art, a public art project of a very big scale. And um, so I started to look at different places I could do that. This is actually in Turkey. And uh, I was eventually, I was invited uh, in, a, in, the, in a Biennale in Antakya, very near the Syrian border. And, um, um, and by talking to people from that, from that uh, city, I, we just realized that it's, it's a, it's a, at that time, I mean, before the war, 
uh, Antakya was, a, was a, 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 a city growing very fast. Uh, as you know, economy in Turkey is very good, and there is a lot of company, and um, and uh, and so the the city was changing at a very rapid uh, speed. So, by talking to people there, I just we just realized that there was no McDonald's in Antakya, and which, in a way, I thought that this is not going to be the case very long. So. We started to, I started to imagine that my intervention, rather than putting a billboard presenting an art project in the city, should be the, 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 the presentation of a, of, a, of a new McDonald's opening in Otakia. And so I started to study uh, those building sites uh, billboards. That's actually from uh, the Centre Georges Pompidou in Metz. Uh, and then I started to look at all the McDonald buildings that are always quite interesting. Sorry for the quality. <laughs> Sorry. It's a nice one. Huh? Yeah. And I, then I was looking for, I thought, immediately I realized that what I was interested in it was not necessarily uh, the building in itself, but the program behind the idea that a McDonald's will come to uh, Antakya, this small town, and, and I always remember my wife is from Bulgaria, and she she could remember vividly that in the 80s, when the first McDonald's opened in Bulgaria, uh, after the country opened, and uh, it was like it was the event, and they she was driving like 30 or 40 kilometers to actually go to eat McDonald's, not really because of eating there, but because it was like the main event happening in, uh, I think, uh, near Burgas on the coast of the Black Sea. And so I was, I was curious about this idea of presenting to the people of Antakya the idea that the McDonald's would open in their city. And I was looking for an architect, but because of the, of, uh, the very, very uh, uh, limited budget we had, I ended up by Photoshop photoshopping existing buildings, trying to do my own little architectural project. And that was, that was uh, what I ended up with. Um, try to, I tried to work as much as I could the, the technical side, but I think then we decided to go very, very simple because I think I was not really so sure that the script of that technical part was actually correct. So I prefer to get rid of that as, and just go very simple. And so that's what was the uh, piece. And they, we selected the, it was actually a very nice uh, area because it was totally probable that something would be built up at that, at that place. And the funny thing is that this afternoon, when I was looking for some more images of um, McDonald buildings, I discovered that one, which was not didn't exist then. It's in Georgia. I think it's brand new. 
connaissez ça Je ne sais pas qui a fait ça, mais c'est un problème. And when I did that, I thought that was do I was doing something that was totally impossible, but obviously. And then we moved to uh, Rotterdam uh, some years, two years later, I think, when uh, I was invited by Vito de Witt to do a project about uh, the public sphere and about trying to, um, to integrate uh, an art piece into the public sphere. So back to the first questions, and, and that raised again uh, some, so many questions, and I think the term integration is the right one because I think that's exactly what I had a problem with, is that the fact that an art piece is usually trying to integrate the city, and I was rather looking for something that was actually create a rupture with the city. Uh, and also, I was, I was interested in some work that could not leave the public uh, cold or, because, um, but I was, I was thinking why, I was actually thinking a lot about the relation we have towards architecture. I was thinking that it's interesting to see how people have a tendency not to really express themselves towards contemporary art, because I think they, they think that they don't know enough to actually express themselves. When they, yet they don't have that feeling towards architectural project. I mean, it, it's, it's very uh, often you can hear people complaining about public buildings and or construction sites and so. I thought it was interesting that people would feel much more relaxed to actually be angry towards a building rather than towards an art piece. So anyway, I was invited by uh, Vito de Vito to do something in the city, and then I thought to do, I wanted to try another billboard, but this time I, was, I really didn't want to work alone on Photoshop, because what I really thought was interesting is not the building in itself, but the program behind the building, and what the building should be for. And so, the Vito de Vit introduced me to a great architect, Nicolas Fierquet, and we started to talk about that project. And my, um, my first intuition was uh, based on a visit I had by accident because I needed something from the computer, and I went to Media Markt in Rotterdam. And I was like, it was, I was under shock because I don't really go to those places. You have Media Markt here? And I was, I was quite impressed by the size of it, but also the social importance of such a place. Like I was, I was first, first of all, I was very impressed by the fact that I could see any kind of public there. I'm going to read that little text because I think I just discovered that that was written by me, actually, when I did the show in Vidovid. I think it's, it's, it's better than trying to explain. Um, uh, the, the project proposed here a vision of how commercial zones will become the only public spaces in the near future, starting from the observation that technology seems to federate an extensive part of the population, incorporating all cultural, religious, and social group. We are mapping out the possibility to create a hub that would bring together a supermarket for electronics, a sports center, and several, worship, uh, several places of worship for Rotterdam's most represented ethnic groups. This is a combination concept that feeds the political dream of, of a unifying and pacifying tool, both healthy and spiritual, which moves toward the future, and last but not least, is good for the economy. So, my my uh, my um, my visit to Media Markt, as I said, was was very impressive in the sense that I could see that a any kind of social uh, 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 layers was represented, and and I thought that was an amazing place that that could bring so many different people together. And so we started to think about this place that would be a mix of, as I said. Uh, uh, 
a place for buying electronics, but also a worship center for people. That Actually, the worship center started from um, uh, a, a time in, in an airport, I forgot in which city I discovered that there was some spaces for for uh, uh, prayer. And one was amazing because it was like, uh, there was a little carpet for Muslim people. There was a little carpet on the floor with an arrow that would indicate the direction of the Mecca. And it was such a minimal space, I didn't take picture, unfortunately, but I thought I was very impressed by that. So I started to think about that, and that I was thinking that actually could be a space in the city, and also and trying to resolve all the problems that the city has, also a lot of spark, parking space, and all that together in one huge project. And so we started to work with Nicolas, I was bringing some images about all the things I wanted to be to see in that building, and all the technical te technological object, uh, I wanted to be not only a place where you could buy technology, but a place that would be in itself a kind of techno technological object by itself. And so we were just uh, that's all the things I was like collecting, also historical buildings uh, and and more recent stuff that were in that idea of a technological object as an architectural. And, uh, and though I was, that's the first thing. I'm sorry, I, I know you probably don't like me to show all those little stages of work, but that was the very early stage, like very basic to go from the uh, electronic, uh, and then trying to do very stupid basic work like Photoshop again here just to see what's how if it's working what's functioning and then I realized that there was an interesting <laughs> parallel that I didn't think of initially but then for some reason we kind of decided and I totally agree that it was not actually really working. We tried few things and more metal and like this was actually fun to do because you understand by moving formally. And then we started to go a little bit more crazy and and then until we got more or less what we ended up with, which is this one. So one other abs aspect of that project was uh, that we decided to, with, that's the, the location was very interesting because it was the museum, it was the villa, the, how is it called? The, it's a, this, this area is a very protected area in Rotterdam because it's all the modernist villas that are there. And, um, and so the, pro the idea is that we would actually destroy four villas, which is ab absolutely impossible. I mean, you cannot touch those buildings. But the idea was to pretend that we would destroy four villas, modernist villas, to build up that complex. And, and the beauty of that thing is that uh, you only need a little square of terrain to actually build up this billboard. And so the billboard was not actually as big as I expected, but anyway, that's what we ended up with. And since the, on the other side, uh, C'est le, le truc pour l'architecture, comment ça s'appelle um, yeah, It was actually, um, the, the, the panel as you see it in this picture is facing the NAI, which is the Netherlands Architecture Institute. And indeed, this is a park of, uh, of several uh, modernist villas. Um, and they were under construction at that time. They were under construction, they were like, I don't know what they were doing, but there was a, like, there they was They had a, reworks. Yeah. yeah. So I think, a lot of people thought that we were actually starting the construction. 
And then we arrived to uh, we arrived to Vienna, where uh, I was invited. Based on the Rotterdam project we did together with Nicolas, we were invited to do the same kind of work. And um, I, Nicolas and I, we just we agreed, and that uh, uh, and and I will uh, leave Nicolas now developing the the project. But we, I would say that we agreed together very quickly that. We wanted to escape the kind of joke uh, aspect that there was in the initial project, in the two previous projects, and we wanted to think, because in a way we discovered that this, this billboard was an amazing tool. And sorry about saying that, uh, I hope there is not too many architects here, but I also realized that being an architect is not really constructing so much I mean, there is a lot of project that only exists through models and drawings, and I was like thinking, why not to go a little step further? This is not so far from the model, but somehow it gives a public existence that architects don't necessarily have often. And I thought that was, that was stupid to use that tool for just doing something purely provocative. So we tried basically to say, listen, let's actually try to do something that would be actually interesting as a as a as a project, and not just purely to provoke people from the street. So that's is that yeah. Essentially, essentially, uh, Rotterdam is probably characterized by uh, its uh, its kind of frivol uh, frivolity in terms of uh, of experimenting new forms of architecture and. and it's like a competition to uh, enhance its skyline continuously. So we, I mean, I think you initially had the impression that the only way to really um, catch the public's attention, which, which was your, uh, which is basically the, the, uh, the essence of the billboard uh, project uh, as we now are repeating it. Uh, um, the only way to do that in Rotterdam would have been to um, I mean, it was to basically uh, be almost vulgar <laughs> in, in, the, in the architecture we were proposing and uh, also to provoke heavily uh, by uh, simply overwriting a heritage, so a modernist heritage that was carefully kept in a little dwarf type of garden next to the uh, uh, Netherlands Architecture Institute. Um, so one of the villas was the... the, uh, the famous uh, Sonneveld, Sonneveld House, uh, which is really one of the landmark in uh, modern architecture. Uh, and here... But I think the villa, we, one of the villas we destroyed was the Riedveld building, no? Yes, two. Mm, yeah. um, so, indeed, here um, on Karlsplatz, the issue was, was much more serious also maybe Vienna is much more serious about architecture <laughs> than, uh, than Rotterdam is. Um, and basically the, the, the opportunity to work on that site uh, and this, the seriousness of the issue of Karlsplatz was somehow forcing us to, you know, uh, take it down from... Yeah. We were kind of forced to, uh, to be a little less vulgar and, and uh, provocative about the, the work and uh, that actually no that's perfect thanks Oops, sorry. Well, yes. So as as Pierre was um, explaining, well, I, I think I think there are two. In this case, we we have developed for this third um, installation of the type, of, um, and the second we did together. Um, we have brought it more than ever to a level where it's it's a, it is it's a duality, 
And uh, well, there are many dualities, uh, and we, a bit like in the eternal sunshine of the spotless mind, we kind of ourselves lost uh, in, a, in, in, in a kind of intermediate uh, state of consciousness now between reality and project, between maybe reality and utopia, or utopia and dystopia. Um, um, that's what we will try to figure out with you, maybe uh, tonight. And the the thing for well, in 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 essence, this is first of all um, an installation in the public space. Uh, so as such, uh, that is a project uh, in itself with with an image, uh, with uh, that can be understood as an installation, as a sculpture, as an as an art piece. But more than in the case of Rotterdam, uh, and due to the seriousness of the of, of the site and the issue, we have really embarked on on the idea of of uh, creating a project for Karlsplatz. Um, now, of course, the issue is, you know, is this project realistic or not? Is it utopia? Uh, but essentially, that was also an exploration of the different between difference between a project and and reality. Um, Knowing that um, uh, in architecture, even uh, as Pierre as Pierre underlined, when is the project when is a project real? When do we really touch reality, especially in urban planning? Uh, so essentially, uh, what's the most important uh, state of the project? Uh, is it its its realization, or is it basically? Um, its essence as as a as a as a, um, as an intensity of of issues uh, grouped together. So well, Can I let's actually, I would like just an anecdote because um, there was Jean Nouvel was coming came to Brussels to present his project on the Gare du Midi and uh, on on which you are also working on the, at the different level but uh, I, I i was i was amazed because <clears throat> so he presented this project i didn't actually see the conference i was told and uh, it's a very big uh, ambitious project and then i heard professional people saying it will never exist and I was like, how weird, because people in the room, they were kind of naive people like me would actually think, okay, it's already done. Like, he has been selected as an architect for doing that project, the building. They worked, I don't know how many months or years on this thing. And then yet people say it will never exist. Maybe you can explain that, because I think that's, for me, it was it's still extremely, uh, is that typical to Belgium? I don't know. Is that typical to public public project of that level? But I thought it was very symptomatic. It's, it's probably typical. It's probably more and more typical of uh, of European, yeah, of European architecture and urbanism and of European culture. That um, yeah, it, and it's not probably. It's also you will find that in other aspects of, of uh, societies uh, that um, a lot is, is said but few gets realized well but I, I might try to start a lecture about architecture <laughs> uh, because I, I have 88 uh, slides <laughs> Um, and so I really would like to insist on, the, on this duality you know, it's a building board but we also made a real project inside that, that uh, building board or side board. Um, and probably the issue is to, to question the public space today in the European city, so through the two dimensions. Uh, you, you discussed public, sp public, space, and, uh, public space and art. Uh, obviously, an urban project is about uh, public space. Um, and I would like you to keep in mind, maybe through these slides, uh, the following question. Is um, the reality of a project the most important uh, aspect of a project? Um, okay, so um, basically this is so the building board. This is the, um, this is the project we have uh, achieved uh, for Karlsplatz. Um, let's go back. We, we call it new uh, 
Vindobona, Neues Vindobona. Um, Vindobona, uh, as Pierre found, uh, was the, f the, the initial name of this site. So if we travel back to immemorial time, of course we, we, um, we find it as a virgin piece of nature. And I guess that this is just a piece of the Danube um, uh, crossing this, uh, this uh, geology. Um, so then 150 years after Christ, a bridge goes uh, over that river. Then we have to wait for the 16th century for some kind of post-medieval um, settlements to, to, to be installed uh, outside of uh, the city, Extramuros. And you see some typical Vauban fortification. I'm not a historian, I guess this is still under the Austro-Hungarian um, Austro uh, Empire. Um, and then suddenly, well, what's, what helps us um, identify the first element of Karlsplatz is of course um, Karlskirch, which is then built here in the 18th century, 1770. Uh, but as you see, the, what generates Karlsplatz is basically already um, several things uh, coming from two sides of a, of a, of a river arm. Um, so it, it starts with a story of, of disarticulation or with, a, with a kind of a composition of, of fragments and uh, as, a, as an eclectic void. Um, the 19th century, of course, with uh, neoclassical solutions, is uh, trying to give some uh, some type of uh, form and identity to to this uh, dual location. Um, closer to us, so end of end of 19th century, um, you still have an indictment of that um, of that delta of of the Danube, and then. It's in with the hygienification and uh, resolutions of the of the turn of the 20th, 20th century, so late 19th century. Uh, as as in many European cities, the um, things are rationalized, and and uh, the the water is basically conducted through the city in in a in a limited way, and therefore basically we we see this we see slowly avenues replacing. Um, and opening the way to basically another type of flux, which is uh, automobile uh, uh, technology. Um, so this is what creates Karlsplatz. And essentially, there has been many pro uh, projects to, to, uh, to in an attempt to make that a space and to make that a park, a green space. Um, what's, what's quite striking, if you pay attention, is to realize that um, in their succession through 150 years, all these projects seem very superficial and, and decorative. Uh, you can clearly identify this kind of early belief in the green solution as something to you know, fix a place that is dysfunctional. It's obvi it obviously doesn't work, uh, we, we, but we still try, our civilization is still trying to pull out these solutions uh, today. Um, so there has been a, 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 a zillion of, of green um, layouts for for this area. Some involving, you know, kind of pergola, and even this one is quite striking because, I mean, it's it's architecture, but the void is so so. It's really um, you could quote it as horror vacui. It's really uh, despite its elegance and, and some interesting aspects in composition, what's, what's striking in Karlsplatz all through this project is that it remains the void it initially was. Um, and why? Because probably it, it was actually grown from by default. You know, it's, it was not installed in the city fabric as a space. So if, even void, if it's dedicated to public space, should probably be designed as, as, a, as a space. Um, and the question, one of the questions I can't answer today, but uh, that we're questioning through our exercise here, is um, to what to what extent could a space um, that is basically an urban leftover uh, become successful as as a as a public space, meaning as a 
build void. So can you make the conversion from a leftover to a, a build void, knowing that the essence is that it's a space with limit, but it's almost like uh, a kind of psych psychoanalytical, collective psychoanalytical issue. If it was initiated from uh, an absence of, of desire or an absence of uh, um, will, uh, then it seems really difficult to turn it into something that suddenly exists as, as um, objectified and uh, identified and desired um, and possessed collectively. So another type of uh, uh, green despair. Um, we go here through some more, in, more recent examples in history and also built once, built attempt, but you still see that something is, is wrong. You still see that these projects uh, somehow um, are kind of suffocated by, by, uh, the, by a remaining void uh, of Karlsplatz. Um, well, that's 1999. It's quite, quite strikingly um, desperate as well. Um, and so that, and here we are today with this um, heritage of, of a void, void as horror vacui, and also as void as potential. Uh, that's the paradox of void um, and the potential of freedom. So it's probably also an interesting, um, this public example, this, this example of a public space, which is not a public space at the same time, is a, a, a right metaphor for the the human condition of basically the the scary freedom. Um, I, I make a small parenthesis through Paris for uh, a, a, an important project in uh, in its art. Uh, it was in 2004 for Les Halles. At the time, I was a young associate of Rem Cola, so I did this with him and for him, uh, and uh, you might know Lehal and why, why this is their name, why they called Lehal. It, it's um, simply, it was the, 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 the market, the fridge of Paris. Um, it was basically the, the, you know, the food market of uh, the whole uh, intramuros of uh, Paris. Um, and in ironically, 1968, <laughs> they demolished it uh, in order to uh, create the biggest uh, uh, intra-regional uh, subway station. So it's, it's this uh, suburban trains. Uh, it, was, it became kind of a pole for suburban trains to cross the heart of Paris, specifically in that point. At that time, technology uh, didn't allow for underground, fully underground works, so they had to dig a huge hole <laughs> and destroy any, any, any. Uh, so basically, remove uh, Les Halles from the center and relocate them on the periphery, which is uh, uh, Rangis, as you might know today, Les Halles de Paris. So the, the food market or uh, hub in Paris is Rangis. It's a, it's a country where everything is centralized and uh, it's interesting to see what happens when you basically uh, relocate the, such a vital element. Um, so they believe that uh, you know, they could find solution to cover the hole afterwards. So there was a, again like a huge uh, abundance of, uh, of proposed solutions, all more convincing than the other. And uh, in the end, after 20 years of, uh, of turmoil and mess, uh, it was Jacques Chirac, uh, one of the French president, who designed a park, <laughs> and uh, which essentially was kind of, sorry, this is aesthetics from 2004. <laughs> uh, it was essentially covering a, a shopping mall with a green carpet, uh, so you see the void, the green, uh, this, this kind of um, strange relationship of answering uncanny void with greenery uh, is, is a, a long European tradition. Um, so basically we went from this to that, uh, which means this. Um, suddenly in Paris, which is a very formal city where uh, precisely public spaces are really formally um, 
inscrit um, basically food printed in the in the fabric uh, suddenly you would generate an informal situation at that time we thought that we could occupy it with a uh, with smaller devices uh, that would, uh, from uh, almost a metabolic uh, point of view, in a metabolist way, um, resolve this this uh, this lost um, orientation, uh, and this was our project, um, yeah, which we won't discuss today, but. Um, it's interesting. I, I, I come back to it for one second. What, what the key issue is, again, um, public space. Um, how do you? Uh, does it need a form? Probably yes. How? How do you? Uh, how do you? Uh, install a public space in a in an urban system. Um, Coming back to uh, Karlsplatz, in fact, <laughs> there was an answer from, from a, an Austrian architect called Perko, uh, Rudolf Perko, in 1930. Uh, he simply said, but well, let's, let's just build it. Um, and uh, there's nothing, it simply, it simply looks like a repetition of the, of the urban fabric around in, in Vienna uh, with some some kind of originality, but um, that's an interesting. That was an interesting punctual reaction to to this issue. Indeed, well, this is this is also probably an issue uh, in our project. There were also other types of strategies that would that would, that would, that sounds that did seem very surprising. It w this is an attempt, for example, to seriously um, move Karls Karls Karlskirch. Um, huh? so thinking that well, there were technologies, you know, that was probably around the time of Ceausescu and uh, moving church was 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 a business. So, <laughs> um, our our colleague Bruckman actually looked into the possibility of uh, slightly changing the the axis of uh, of Karlskirche. Um <laughs> and then it goes. With the la the uh, the end of the 20th century, it seems to go more and more desperate. Like th this is six uh, car parks, so this is, this is parking for cars. This hosts 1,200 cars, and and it's it becomes uh, kind of uh, this project voluntarily uh, questioned the, the, you know the cohabitants, uh, the the, state, the 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 relationship between Karlskirche and and the car. Um, this is a slightly more idealistic situationist version for Karls, uh, Karlsplatz. Uh, situationist in the sense of new Babylon, uh, you know, constant new and nice, uh, project. I don't know if I'm, I'm, we are speaking to artists or architects here, but uh, they were active in uh, clearly in both fields. And um, this is a program that would have been dedicated to education um, and also to uh, academia uh, institutions uh, disconnected from the ground but in a kind of uh, naive way um, it would go and meet Karlskirk you know um, and then uh, Vienna is also famous for its um, uh, radical resonances in uh, in utopian uh, production uh, we have uh, mentioned the, disap the kind of sudden disappearance of, uh, well, not sudden because, but of Hans Solane, uh, incredibly last Thursday. Um, this is another group that, uh, that also created a kind of parking in the form of a flipper. So it, it seems that Karlsplatz becomes ironically uh, accepted as being dedicated to the, to the automobile, to the car. Um, in any case, underneath Karlsplatz is, you know, beyond, below the greenery, a little bit like in Le Halle in Paris. What you find is an is an insane tech, uh, machine dedicated to circulation uh, that is barely hidden under the ground. Um, so it's also quite kind of strange how we can 
find solutions for the underground that are this complex and leave the <laughs> surface still basically undefined. Uh, and it's probably because of the history of this void. Um, okay, so today we won't show pictures of uh, Karlsplatz today because you, you probably cross it daily. Um, but Pierre <laughs> found this uh, quote on uh, Wikipedia. Uh, like the chapter five of Karlsplatz definition is drug culture. Um, and it is said in Austria itself, the word Karlsplatz is a synonym for an open drug scene. <laughs> For this reason, there was the first police monitored protection zone for the security, which will, okay, so, um, which uh, probably directly echoes again with Utopia, with uh, this idea of horror vacui, you know, it's, it's a bad space, it's a void with drug addicts. Um, so this identity seems to be quite permanent. Uh, by, well, it's the heritage of, of, of this condition, uh, this post-medieval condition. Um, yeah, a little tribute to Hans Olein, inevitably. Um, preparing this lecture, we were actually reading about him uh, last week, and um, it, it's, it is clear that he's the founder of, of dystopia. dystopia so. Of all uh, of all European architects, he's the one who uh, triggered the uh, the counter utopian dimension in in architecture with uh, his free works of collage, uh, with the idea that uh, Alist ist Architektur, um, and uh, indeed, it's it's kind of difficult to understand fully, even for for uh, for us architects and, and artists what this meant in its time, you really have to uh, uh, imagine what it means in the 60s to, to do this. It, it's simply, it's after the, the heaviness of, of, uh, of uh, half a century of, of modernism, functionalism, um, and seeing some kind of reactionary uh, postmodern um, strategies uh, arising, it, it's, it is uh, probably an act of restoring architecture for itself. Uh, you speak about the, the Rolls Royce? Yeah. I, thought maybe I, I guess you've seen it in the picture. Yeah? I, thought that for, <laughs> I have no idea when, uh, because there is the famous Panofsky book, Les Antecedents Idéologiques de la Calendre Rolls Royce, mais je ne sais pas quand est-ce qu'il l'a écrit. So I was thinking that maybe it was like clin d'oeil to that, but I don't know. It might be, but uh, I think that um, well, his, the message of Hans Olein and dystopia uh, is simply to uh, to free architecture to 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 come back to the. It, it, I don't speak German. I'm sorry, but there is a, a Zuruk. There's a famous quote of Hans Olein that says, uh, "Return to architecture." So Zuruk Architektur or something like that, yeah. and. Um, of course, the only thing it says is like, we do not need to talk about uh, progress or about functions and hygiene and uh, to do architecture. We can start from scratch. Architecture stands for itself. Uh, and we, we make architecture, then we will see how uh, people uh, adapt to it. That was a kind of counter statement. Um, so yes, it's this, this leads us to the issue of architecture without program. Um, that is, together with the issue of um, the survival of public space today, uh, you know, two, two things that we, we're working for, basically. Um, yeah, so it brings us back to Karls Flats and, and, and the intention of this installation. Um, Architecture for itself, uh, without program. So, can, can we, can, do you, uh, can, may I interrupt you? Or, or you want to very, speak? very, no, 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 one minute. <laughs> if you don't want to move yourself. So. No, no, go, go, please. It was interesting because initially, the f when I started on those projects, I was totally obsessed with the idea of program. Like a building is nothing 
the program is what is the most important thing. And, and, and then, uh, but together we agreed, because we actually thought, first we thought, let's do build up structures. And we, the idea was to uh, start a business to build up structures that would be sold, or the program would be determined by who would be buying the space, uh, something like that, right? We're thinking, how do we, we don't, it's too big to actually determine the program ourselves. I think there was also, it was so huge that we thought, let's decide about structures and we imagine a more flexible way to, for people to, uh, um, to acquire and to give a program to each structure rather than giving this program by ourselves. That was correct? Yes, well, yeah, indeed, but um, okay, essentially, um, it's really it's questioning. So they, the the two key questions are uh, the survival of the public space today. So the public space is is an endangered endangered species. Uh, uh, in the case of in the case of Karlsplatz, it's it's a, a semi dysfunctional one, or it has issues. So ironically, we're proposing, uh, as uh, Perco uh, did in uh, the 30s, we're proposing to simply build Karlsplatz. We thought, okay, after 150 years of attempts in solving it, uh, there, there are other public spaces in Vienna that are successful. Uh, the goal today is to densify, you know, we need to, uh, at a global level, um, more than half of the world's population is uh, living in urban environments, so we need to make the, the urban, urban environment more efficient, we need to, there's a need, obviously, to uh, densify cities, and without, uh, for all these reasons, Karlsplatz is a perfect place to, to build fully and to inhabit, so that was a kind of dystopian um, yeah. axis. And the, the second one was then uh, also um, to, to uh, consider that uh, due to the urgency and in order to be uh, maybe also sustainable and efficient, we would, uh, for an, an issue of economy of scale, we would build it in one go, uh, now that we can, and, uh, and let the freedom for the program to basically adapt to those uh, to those structures so the the goal was um yeah to basically fill fill that void and simply uh, provide um, um, uh, pro uh, create an architect uh, architectonic reality uh, prior to all all program um, so we have worked on on a family of structures um, but what, when, when you don't have a program, what you, uh, what's left to uh, to do is basically select. Uh, is, um if I may, just this anecdote, the, I think the idea of constructing was also very much influenced by the Taksim event that happened exactly when we were working on that yeah. project, the big scandal in in Istanbul, and that park that was supposed to be destroyed to to be to build a shopping mall and so i think we were we were a lot thinking about that as well yep it was part of these uh, stig stigmat of of the disappearance of public space that we wanted to refer to um so how do you we also thought that it should be uh, plausible for a developer to uh, embark on such a project and to to um, consider it as feasible and something that you could actually realize so how do you do um, uh, how do you rebuild a place a, a square such a, as Calplatz? basically we started with the extension of the ex existing street network of Vienna um, and then develop the, the f family of structures. Um, regarding uh, the, the urban fabric, the, the need to densify, of course, means that what we have there is, is uh, of a higher 
uh, average height in the context because today we need to be denser than uh, yesterday. Um, but we thought it was reasonable to uh, remain underneath the cupola of Karlskirch. Uh, otherwise, you know, you enter a, po a political uh, area of discussion. Um, and then, literally, in 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 a, in a, as as also we considered, as I said, that sustainability can also be linked to economy of scale. We we were looking at the basics of. Uh, of, of um, you know such logic that that, that may be a, bit, a little controversial, but um, we thought it should be f built in one go um, because obviously it creates much less uh, collateral damages. You know, it's like one construction site. Um, you you mobilize the effort once. You don't maintain a construction site for uh, several decades. So we we really embraced that. <laughs> Very contradictory vision. It's also the fact is that architecture today um, in in Europe comes as a superficial last step in in uh, most of the urban projects. Um, and we, the statement here is to say, what if um, it's all started with architecture, and then you see, you know, and that's the tribute probably to Hans Olein, uh, <laughs> completely <laughs> unexpected. Um, connection um, so we start from architecture architecture without program um, as also a void in fact to colonize but you know ironically it becomes a a, a void that uh, is a space um, that is spatialized um, an analogy to Arles amphitheater and uh, probably a proof that uh, over um, millennia, uh, you know, a Roman amphitheater can become um, a, a fortress, an inhabited fortress uh, slash village. Um, well, those are references um, that I will pass through. So we really thought that we should um, basically do things the other way around and let the program and let basically users and life uh, occur after um, architecture, and um, which was also an, an, an opportunity to to basically rediscover um, architectonic values uh, in their primal state. Um, we end up with uh, seven units plus one. Um, the first. Is, uh, is called Le Plan Libre. Uh, it offers uh, to develop 67,800 uh, uh, square meters. <laughs> um, Le Plan Libre uh, can refer culturally, uh, in absence of any program, to uh, Le Corbusier, to, um, uh, to Miss Van der Rohe, uh, to uh, yeah. but then the second unit uh, basically is based on, on the idea of bays, windows. Um, it's definitely uh, something that uh, Aldo Rossi has used and, and Grassi as well. This is Aldo Rossi. Um, you, the beauty of this is that you're free for once to uh, imagine what the um, what the way of inhabiting those structures would, would be, how to complete them. Um, the, the unit three um, is beam to column, uh, which is, you know, of course, referring to Sol Lewitt, but uh, more or less to every architect alive today. And um, um, then we, we also wanted to um, integrate some more recent techniques. Uh, this is, um, a tribute to the precast wall, which is probably the most economical and uh, yeah, um, efficient. It's the one we had most trouble with. Yeah. <laughs> uh, yeah. The, the cheapest, the most. Uh, yeah, it's basically the most um, cost-conscious uh, technique today. Um, this is an example by some Belgian colleagues in Tirana. Um, 51 and 4E. 
Uh, the unit 5 was based on the idea of, uh, of uh, shades, so those kinds of um, veils, concrete veils, that, as used by Le Corbusier in uh, Chandigarh. Um, unit 6 is simply based on walls or sheer walls. Uh, unit 7 is the mantle, uh, as used by Ms. Ms. Van der Hoe, so it's a structural curtain wall that actually carries the the inhabitable surfaces from the outside. Uh, it also can be connected to the, the Greek tolos. And then un unit eight uh, is Karls Kirche, of course. That uh, more than ever, I mean, that is now finally not the only problemati pro problematic monument. Uh, it's uh, basically being joined by uh, seven others monument. Um, in this continuous monument, uh, to quote uh, Superstudio, um, well, about uh, patrimony and the issue of, of the heritage, of course we preserve everything. <laughs> um, you, there is a perspective um, that is in fact strong and uh, almost, inter yeah better than today. Uh, I think that Otto Wagner's, um, uh, Otto Wagner's piece there today is a little bit lost in, uh, in, a, in a space with no orientations and uh, this could be actually uh, much, uh, much more contrasted. Um, those, are, those are some, yeah, kind of aesthetical moments that uh, are generated between this Neues Windobona and its context. Um, and also within itself, from one structure to the other, uh, suddenly you see that probably more than in a uh, contemporary developer's project, you see some, uh, that in this void there is already a, a kind of a fragment of um, uh, some some fragments of lives and and an identity that can uh, occur. Um, so, architecture alone, with no program, with uh, with no intention, is already creating its own relationships. Uh, yeah. Well, I will skip this. This is just an example that. Questioning the issue of um, a reality project um, and you know how important the reality of a project is. What's what's the difference between a project and and its and and reality? Uh, maybe the role of of uh, our generation as architects is to knowing that the prophecy of dystopias has happened in in some part. In any case, maybe, but but unfortunately in a formless way. Um, maybe our role is to build some some of these dystopias as um, as fragments, uh, but uh, as, as fragments of consciousness. And so, um, yeah. I think I will finish here. Well, the, some quotes of. Um, and so line um, that I that uh, we rediscovered and liked a lot. Um, the shape of the building does not develop out of the material condition of its purpose. A building shall not show its purpose. It is not an expression of structure and construction. It is not an enclosure or refuge. A building is itself. Architecture is without purpose what we build will find its usefulness, etc. Yeah, today man is a master over infinite space. That's it. The end. Thank you. <laughs>
I think it's very odd that two young people like yourselves, at least you're younger than I am, should go the way of Ledoux, Boulet, and Albert Speer. This is one of the most fascistic projects I have ever seen. It is overwhelming, it is overpowering, and if it were really built, it would ruin this city. You've said a few things tonight and have given no reason for these. For instance, Verdichtung. This word I've often heard because I studied architecture. There is no reason to cram more people into this city. We need space, not buildings. Another thing I disagree with, uh, this honoring of Hans Holein is just a masquerade. You are honoring Albert Speer and all the architects that worked for Stalin and all these weird nut dictators. But unfortunately, I don't blame you. I kind of think your ideas are interesting. I blame our politicians for letting people like you build things in this city. And I'll tell you why. I actually think that our politicians are so corrupt, so dishonest, and so greedy that they will actually have something like that built. And I did not come here because I was interested in this. I came here because I thought this is actually going to be built. And I can tell you one thing, the Viennese do not want this. Now, I sound like an American, but I'm an Austrian. I've been living here since 1970, and as a painter and as a writer and as an architect, I've been making a steady contribution to the cu culture of this country and to the culture of Central Europe. I'm very concerned about this project because I fear that if our dictators had really, if they really wanted to build something like this on the Karlsplatz, they would do it. And you don't seem to care whether the Viennese would like it or not. No, but I think, if I may, I'm not surprised. <laughs> one of the basic, one of the basic function of dystopia is to basically verify where the system goes. It doesn't mean we subscribe to it. It's a way, it's another way to be critical about a situation by not being against it, but by exaggerating the movement that is already uh, happening. If you don't understand, I mean... No, not at all. <laughs> yes. The fear that I have, because I'm an Austrian and I know my country and my culture, and I know how an ostracism thinks that some people really want to um, be realized. Maybe not this project, but I know that very often in Austria, projects like this are prepared through an art, um, artistical event like this, um, uh, in order to prepare the public mentally for a thing like this. Uh, this, this is a, I mean, you cannot know this because you're Belge and French. Um, <laughs> but this is the typical Austrian, this is the typical Austrian way how most politicians and um, are, yeah, how the politicians work in Austria by preparing mentally and, well, in the population for a, through exaggerating a thing like this, yeah, then to calm the population, say, well, uh, we won't do it like this because this, of course, this is just an art uh, event and 10 years later, th something else which is not this exaggerated, but in this, in this kind, in this style, normally they really try to realize a thing like this. This is why I'm a little bit... Um, um, critical. I mean, you know what I mean? Do you understand? Yes, I would like to answer the, the first question slash accusation because it was quite a serious one. And I, I think, Mister, I think you take us a bit too seriously. Uh, but it's perfect because it's exactly the game we want to play with you. Uh, <laughs> Okay, That's indeed. So you, you, you... They actually show us these big posters 
to show us what is going to be built. I, we were all shocked. I mobilized some politicians I know. I, mobil I thought this place was going to be filled with people we invited because we were absolutely shocked and disgusted by this idea. And we are not the United States of America. If they build things like this in the States, it's because they don't have beautiful architecture to destroy there. There's nothing in the whole of the United States nearly as beautiful as the Charles Church. Nothing. Nothing approaches it. So I agree that something has to be done with Cosplatz. We have to do something, and it has to be beautiful and not monst monstrous like that. And, that's what, and this young lady is totally right. They put up this kind of stuff, and then they build it only half as tall. But half as, half as tall as this is already a huge catastrophe. I mean, I just couldn't believe when I saw this. But I know my politicians, and I know how corrupt they are, and I know how they do not care what we think. They don't care. Believe me. They don't care. We, we all live in the same reality. <laughs> möglich auf Deutsch und sie übersetzen. Ja. Yeah. I think okay. well zwei zwei Yeah, I, I need to rip, sorry. I, there's a lot of things said so we need to and it's really the, this interaction is um, this interaction we have with you, we lucky we have with you uh, is is made in order to raise issues. The problem is that it raises so many issues at the same time that uh, um, uh, we will probably not be able to answer it, but the goal is to raise issues, indeed. Um, you must be aware that, of course, um, um, any ambition in, in Europe, in any case, be assured, is basically uh, going through processes that are uh, systematically tempering it. So it's, it's a good thing sometimes, sometimes it's a bad thing. Um, but you, you stated that this is Albert Speer architecture, that this is fascist. This is another issue. What's the, you know, how can you uh, make a link between an, an architecture and, and its political um, value and content? How can you make, how can you, I would, I would be glad to hear. I think, I think, no, I think that this is, this is also, even that is something we have lost. Um, I think that uh, as 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 a, as a as a civilization, as a European civilization, we we don't architecture today is so superficial that we we don't know what it means anymore, and we don't sh we we are unable to share that the, the sense uh, that very sense, the political sense uh, of architecture or urbanism, is lost. Uh, well, how would you uh, how would you guarantee that this is, uh, you know, motivated by, by fascism or... But anyway, I would like to add something about the context of this show and then, and then uh, there is a question here. You are, we have to also, I have to re, re, uh, remind uh, people here that this was part of a show that was Salon, Salon of Angst and, and uh, their angst. Huh? And, and I was basically actively thinking about what kind of project I could do that would actually to be 300% anxiogen, which I think is why now you're reacting, because in fact I was trying to touch where it's painful. So I'm totally with you on that, but that's the na very nature of the way we wanted to, to talk about that, that difficult question. I have so you can be against that strategy, but She confronted all the time. Uh, I don't need to see these things anymore. It's just been a confrontation and uh, to raise issues. I don't want to see issues. I want to see a graceful and beautiful city that's not overcrowded. I want to see a masstab, a scale that is to the human being. This is monstrously big and repetitious, just like the buildings of Boulay and Ledoux. It's just as abstract and it's just as huge and uh, inhuman as Albert Speer. It's a, an expression of megalomania because of the scale. Now, you may agree with me, you know, maybe I'm running through the door with you. Uh, don't take this personally, but I am upset because of my politicians. 
They are ruining the city that I live in presently in Klosen Neuburg, and they want to ruin this city, and we can see that they want to ruin it. We can see what they're doing to the city of Vienna. They're ruining it. This is not Cincinnati. This is not the Bronx. It's not Hong Kong. It's a little town that wants to be like Paris and isn't quite as beautiful, but it's still very beautiful. And beauty, we could talk about that. That would take another few hours, right? What, what, do, you, what do you think of uh, Hans Solane's project here, for example? For I like some of his building. I thought no, it was but the <laughs> best for him to build this across I'm talking about this project on the screen now. Um, It's just that yeah. the technology of collage has evolved. Ich möchte gern etwas zu mehreren Punkten sagen. Zu Hans Hollen, den ich gut kannte, und auch sein Manifest zum Bau und zu Öffentlichkeit. Was ist Öffentlichkeit? Was ist öffentlicher Raum? Und auch zu dem, was Sie zuletzt gesagt haben, nämlich, dass der Sinn der Architektur verloren gegangen ist, denn dann darf ich kein Architekt sein, wenn ich nicht mehr daran glaube. Zu Hans Hollen, und das ist mir sehr wesentlich. Bitte? Ja. Ja, yeah, uh, die da, uh, the, the young lady said that if you don't have a reason for building, then you shouldn't be an architect. What Hans Hollein said about architecture just being for itself, is this true what I'm saying? It's a, very, it's, a, it's a great fallacy. It's not true. Architecture is for human beings. It's not just for itself. Is this what I'm, is that, am I pra paraphrasing what you said? Perhaps you, you can, uh, you, you can uh, concentrate. Uh, Hans Hollen wrote this in the 60s. This was a reaction on a completely other uh, human, post-fascist human. It was a reaction yeah, against this was a reaction. And he and all these post-war avant-gardists uh, contributed to our state of an other public. And I was shocked in the same way as you and other colleagues of mine to see this. Uh, there were colleagues who were really shocked and, so, uh, and thought it would be built. I doubted it be because I know the place where art, art projects are. And but I was, uh, I was really furious because this Kunsthalle is a public founded art space. And what was the issue of an art project which has an issue to, to, to mock people? Uh, this, it is a mockery. Yes, yeah. yes. It's, it's a mockery. Because really, das bringt, das bringt die Leute, die Menschen, die eine Beziehung zu Kunst entwickeln sollen können, in einem öffentlichen Raum, wo sie überhaupt nicht die Möglichkeit haben, sich darauf einzustellen, einfach vorbeifahren, ganz kurz, bringt sie in die Situation, sich mit etwas auseinandersetzen, aha, da passiert was und nachher dann das Edge kommt, reingefallen. Das finde ich, that. ja. Uh, please, please, can, can we ask for our moderator to translate uh, and summarize? Otherwise, so, I think the core of the project is to show that this could happen, and that's the, it's a very reactive project as well. We also react strongly to the way things go. It's just that you and I, we don't have the same way to deal with it. You understand? I'm not more happy no, than you are. And, and 
Und das ist ein Satz, my fourth point, that you are very ambiguous about this. On the, other, on the one hand, you say, oh no, we just would raise the issue. On the other hand, you say, oh, media market uh, should be inside here. People should possess this space. Uh, uh, and the horror vacui, uh, what, 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 uh, yeah, then? Yeah. The moment, I mean, I speak now for, for the Kunsthalle and we talk about different taste in art. You, of course, di completely dislike the, the project, well, but, really yeah, but, uh, I know, but I mean, like, let's be open-minded enough to let people you know, make up their mind about the project. I think it's interesting because at least it creates like some resonance. It is a project that uh, is controversy. Some people said they think it's banal because they immediately said like, you know, this will never be built and this is just like another hoax. But I think we, we had like other talks here in this space about, for instance, the idea of public space, the notion of public space. Is there something as public space anymore or are we living in a post-public space era? Is it possible to think about urbanism in terms of preservation of what we have or do we have to create ideas for the future, etc.? It's, it's like something which is just there in order to in positive terms, inspire people, or in negative terms, to upset people, but at least there is a reaction. And the very first um, image you show, this very famous Robert and Diana love sign in New York, it's there, but nobody notices anymore. It's just there. It's just like an obstacle in public space. The reaction is that basically what you, uh, you're against is the fact that we show a nightmarish vision in a public space without being overly simplifying the fact or overly explaining to the people that this is a nightmare that the, okay i mean you're against the strategy but what can i do that's the strategy we thought was more appropriate to raise questions that were difficult I'm, i cannot say anything else if you well if we are, I'm, I'm a bit surprised that there are such reactions that um, somehow are so concerned about the, the plausibility of this project because anyone can realize that this cannot happen for different types of reasons. Well, yeah, exactly, exactly. I'm, we are aware of that, so I will jump to the next point, which is that this is made in order to uh, have uh, people react to, you know, what if uh, this would happen, what would you do? And then, huh? um, so, uh, at it, it, the interest of a project, I was raising the issue about the difference of a project between a project and its reality, and I think uh, the interest of, it pro of a project is not necessarily its, its reality, it's uh, it's first of all the question, the questions it raises. Um, I prefer a project that raises the right question and never happens, than a project that happens without raising any question. A project that happens without raising any question is what we see today, and this is a much, much probably much worse form of alienation and um, and authority than, uh, than uh, all, all the bad things you have named just before. Yes. Uh, I, I wanted to ask, um, do you know specific, uh, the specific symbolism of the Charles Church? Um, why is it directed towards, um, for instance, the cathedral or the palace, the imperial palace? Uh, do you know the history behind the building itself? Because you we, mentioned we're not, we're not the, moving you, uh, Karlskirk. Someone else was planning to move it, right. move it but uh, but uh, we, because you mentioned the Karlskirk as being a problem or some uh, pro problematic uh, monument, actually it was built in order uh, as a thank you by uh, Emperor Charles 
uh, that uh, Vienna survived the plague. And it's, uh, for us Viennese, it's not problematic at all. It's uh, like my, uh, like uh, um, it was mentioned before, it's, it's actually uh, a symbol of, of high culture. And so I, I mentioned, uh, I wanted to mention that because as a Viennese uh, and as a painter and as an artist, I'm deeply offended by this, uh, by this uh, mentioning that, uh, I believe you uh, made that uh, statement that it's a problematic uh, monument. Thank you. I hope you don't think I want to erase memory or that I'm... No, no, it's not about you, actually. It's about our corrupt politicians. Yeah, but, but we, we, all, we all agree on it goes, that. It goes beyond that. I think it's not... Maybe, maybe yeah. So it's us. It's about... Uh, it's about... Uh, yeah, today so and... and that's something that they would actually build something like that. They would actually build it. Do, does anybody agree with me or no? Yeah. We had some city, we, we had some, and, and maybe that's, we, we that's should that's just like, maybe, maybe I sit in front to give it a bit more structure. Now, may I say something? We had, we had other talks and we had like actual, actual real like city developers here. And the first question of my colleague was, do you believe this is something that could be built or should be built? And they looked at it and they were immediately saying like, no way. And they said, it's impossible to build something like this. I, I share your skepticism, but this is, you know, not, that's not in a way like, you know, an issue we can solve. We can just point at it. So, uh, but I, think I think we should have like one last question. Uh, then I, th I think it, will, uh, it wouldn't be built in this way. Uh, I agree with you, but I, I understand the fear the lady raised uh, that a part of the project the right or the left side of one part could remain really uh, as a future project because uh, now the, the, the whole place is, uh, is, is a traffic place. Yeah, yeah. Uh, and and I also criticize the way uh, which uh, in which this void is dealt. Now it, it's it's only for traffic. Uh, yeah, and, and this should be changed, but I personally would uh, perceive uh, the void uh, for itself because it's an empty place in a crowded town. And if you have such places occasionally, like here, uh, then we should uh, keep it in the town and not to uh, build uh, projects I there. I it's, think a, we it's, should, a, it's a big you know, chance to, to keep such places, I but agree. you have to, uh, to structurize it we, and, and give it back to the void. I, I think we, we, we're not here to discuss, the, discuss Karl's Platz, but, no, but uploading, you're uploading nothing because they, we're not discussing a project, we're not discussing Karl's Platz. You should look at this now, honestly, to try to finish this, uh, uh, not losing the, the sense of why we sp spent four months working on this. I ask you to look at this as, as if you were uh, watching a painting uh, from Le Salon des Refusés. Look, this is Le Déjeuner sur l'herbe, uh, right? So the only thing it serves is actually raising issues that uh, unfortunately are apparently not properly raised otherwise than by such provocations. So. Um, it, it, your reaction actually underlines that you know we we uh, uh, as a European collectivity, as as group civilizations in Europe, are not used anymore to um, debate architecture and and um, basically understand the cultural mechanisms that are be behind. It's not about Karl's Platz. It is you know about there were two questions. Um, what, how, do we, how do we do public space today, you know? How can we collectively think public space? Secondly, uh, what's the role of architecture? Is it the last thing that comes as a cosmetic uh, addition to all kinds of other political, economical, uh, moral, su sustainable issues? Um, no, we, we, we want to put, uh, put the key issues uh, back at the front, and and this is the way to do it. So um, 
I think your reaction somehow. Uh, but, but you see the uh, acid. The, the, this is a painting. So this is a painting of of uh, of, ap of apocalypse, right? But okay. what are the components of 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 this tableau? That you know, which kind of uh, instruments for thinking the reality can this actual actual tableau uh, give us? Uh, um, I, wa I want to come back to uh, to public. There is a fundamental misunderstanding about public. I agree with you, Vanessa, about these discussions, but this is not public. This is a very, very small, engaged minority which is able uh, uh, to come and to integrate in this discourse, but all the rest uh, are discussed or say, oh, like this, they do with us what they want. This is exactly and what we criticize. Is this is what we criticize. Yes, we would, like, we would like to discuss this with a thousand people, of course. So we, this is, we're pointing at the fact that there is you rarely... You reach them. They were, uh, yeah. Your billboard would be the media to reach them. This, you can't reach them by discussing. The, and this, this, is the this is what Andreas Spiegel meant. You know. Yeah. But you expect something from art that art can't deliver. And I think at least it's a starting point to point at the fact that as there is a lack of public space, there is a lack of public discussion. And I think this could be an initial point that some people at least do something else. And I would like to finish this discussion now because we had it with all the other events before. It starts at a certain point and then it's never ending because uh, there's so many issues related to that. But on the other hand, I mean, it's rare that an artwork in a way touches people in a way that they think they really have to like, you know, get emotional and uh, start a controversy. So thank you very much, Nicolas Firqui, and thank you very much, Pierre Bismuth. The billboard will be there for some weeks. <laughs> <laughs> I know. Then you can forget about it. The beanies will be conditioned into thinking, well, it's going to be built. In a few weeks, life will be back to normal. <laughs>